Great. So after an amazing session with our Wonder Woman panel, like I mentioned, we're going to move you from insurance ecosystem to completely different mineral exploration and space operation. Because next up, I have Ivan Corneris, CEO of Amentum Aerospace. And he will be talking about from mineral exploration to space operations and how to enable access to scientific models with web APIs. So Ivan, uh, really nice to have you here. Thank you so much for joining in. And as part of our uh, common standard, we will reserve last couple of minutes for any of the Q&A that will be coming in from the audience. And uh, the stage is uh, completely yours to take it further. Great. Thank you for the intro, Dirosh, and thank you for having me. Uh, just checking the audio is OK, and you can see the slides OK. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yes, and thank you for tuning in, everybody. Uh, it's very exciting for us to be here. It's our first API days. Uh, we're learning a lot, uh, particularly loving all of the sessions with regards to the async API and event-driven architecture. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to be here. Um, and by we, I mean the team. So I'm presenting this on behalf of Team Momentum um, and would like to acknowledge all of their hard work. So an outline to the presentation, a couple of introductions, myself and the company, um, the problem that we're helping to solve with web APIs, and then a couple of examples of APIs we're developing, and just apologies in advance because I will geek out at this point, um, but then I'll come back down to earth and we'll say a few words about the business side of things. And so personal introduction, I've got a background in physics, so spent many years at universities here and overseas uh, developing sensors to detect ionizing radiation our ionizing radiation, that could be gamma radiation emitted from radioactive materials, some of the sources that are used to image patients uh, or treat cancers, uh, and indeed um, the radiation that is abundant in space that we'll talk about uh, a little later on. Now, when developing any hardware or conducting experiments, uh, there's a lot of interest in developing physics-based modeling software. Um, so that one can optimize things in simulation before developing expensive hardware or perhaps conducting potentially dangerous field measurements. Um, so a lot of the research was along those lines, developing modeling-based uh, software. Uh, and radiation is ubiquitous, so that was applied to many industries. Um, and then some experience in the film industry and with defense. So I was trying to find an exciting photo of me doing science, but photos of people actually doing science aren't that exciting. They're just staring at computer screens or bits of equipment, uh, but this is the most exciting thing I could find. So that's at the beginning of my career, visiting CERN to check out the Large Hadron Collider that was under construction uh, before it went in the ground with some Italian colleagues there. So that was very cool. And it looks cool. So there you go. Um, started this company in 2016. Uh, started out providing professional engineering services to defense and aerospace clients, generally around ionizing radiation and generally developing bespoke scientific modeling software. Uh, those types of calculations are computationally intensive. So that goes hand in hand with high performance computing capabilities to crunch numbers. And during the course of that service provision, started to recognize a pattern um, in that when you're developing scientific modeling software, you often rely on other pieces of software to provide a source term, a boundary condition in the context of radiation. Let's say looking at that image there, you might have a model of the atmosphere of the earth that's uh, characterized by one piece of software. Another piece of software gives you the radiation coming into the atmosphere. Um, and you need to, there's a lot of interface software that needs to be developed. And so after a few times, started to think, well, if we're having this problem, other people are as well. So maybe we can help out. So yes, there's an abundance of scientific models that are essential to modern society. We don't see them because they're behind the scenes embedded in other software. Uh, examples would be the weather, uh, that's an obvious one, or GPS that relies on some other software to do some corrections. Same, same, there's an abundance of scientific data. So you'll have sensors scattered all over the planet 
um, acquiring scientific data, satellites orbiting the Earth, um, doing the same. Uh, but it's not always. So they're available, but they're often difficult to access and use in modern software. And as a side note, if you ask AI what a scientist looks like, that's what you get, which is not actually far from the truth, other than they generally wouldn't point at a screen because we have mice for that, mouses, uh, and don't always wear lab coats. Other than that, it's pretty good. So no surprises for guessing what we thought the solution would be, given we're at API days, um, web APIs. So we saw that as a win-win-win. Uh, the developers win, obviously. It's easier to integrate uh, into their software. Uh, the data providers, very importantly, win as well. So the APIs help to boost adoption of their data and the software they're developing. A lot of the time, these organizations, they're government funded. So they need to show that the development of this data and the software is for good reason and people are actually using it. So web APIs can help. Uh, if they publish scientific journal articles, that usage can help to drive citations, which is, is another KPI. And very importantly, they can understand their users better. So if you have an open source project, sometimes you lose a bit of touch with um, the user information and with APIs, it's a, a bit more um, accessible. So if they understand the users, what they're using it for, what their problems might be, they can, that can then inform decision-making on subsequent projects. Um, and another image that AI comes up with when you search for joy is that one. So clearly that guy just found a web API that solves a lot of problems for him. And so the first example I'd like to talk about is a geomagnetism API that we've developed. So if you think back to science class with a piece of paper and the iron filings, little bar magnet on that, the iron filings will line up to the magnetic field lines. So that's sort of what the Earth is. Not, it's a bit more wonky, but generally that's it. And the source of that magnetic field comes from the molten outer core of the Earth. Um, and there are less significant components from materials in the crustal regions. As you go away from the surface of the Earth, there's an influence um, of the sun, so the solar wind. And it's very important that we understand what that looks like, how it varies with position, and also with time. Uh, because it's changing. Those magnetic poles, they drift with time, and it's really important we understand how that's happening. So again, there are sensors scattered around the world in absor observatories uh, to measure that, as well as satellites, so dedicated satellites, it's called the Swarm Mission. Uh, they're orbiting the Earth, measuring the magnetic field. Uh, and this information has fed into the development of modeling software. So one of those is called the World Magnetic Model. And that provides users with magnetic declination, inclination, and field intensity. So what do those quantities mean? Well, if I could get a show of hands on who's used a compass. Yep, okay, it's everybody because it's embedded in our phones. So we don't just use GPS to navigate, also there's magnetic navigation. Uh, but if you think back to the old school compass, that needle's pointing in the direction of geomagnetic north, but you need to know the difference between that and the geographic north. And that translation, so the angle between the two in the horizontal plane, that's your declination. Uh, and that's what the model gives you. And quite literally, without that model, we lost. And so we developed a web API to make it much easier to access. So to show you what that looks like, we're connecting to a Mentum 1, our Earth observation satellite, uh, which is actually just a game engine. So we can strip away the atmosphere and overlay or import uh, geomagnetic information that we draw from the interface, uh, just pointing out a few features. You've got yellow, which is high magnetic field intensity over the north and south geomagnetic poles. Note that it looks, it's a bit wonky relative to the geographic poles. And a very important feature we'll come back to later uh, is this anomalous weak spot over the South Atlantic. Um, so keep that in mind, because we'll come back to that. And before I forget, also a quick plug to the Amentum blog. If you're drawing in this much information to overlay onto maps, uh, it can result in quite a few API requests. So there's a neat little post there about um, hitting the API with asynchronous requests using request futures, if you're a Python programmer. And in case that video was choppy for anybody, here are a couple of stills with the key points with that weak spot over the Atlantic. 
And so where is this information used? I mentioned earlier in navigation, it's critical. Uh, it's also used a lot in mineral exploration. So people will do aeromagnetic surveys whereby they fly over an area, um, trailing sometimes uh, a magnetometer to measure the magnetic field intensity. And then this world magnetic model can be their baseline. So if the intensity is higher or lower than you'd expect, there might be something interesting um, below where you can explore. Uh, and also it's used in education now. So at this point in time, I'd like to shout out to Bart and the forward thinking geography teachers at Don Bosco College in Belgium. So they put together some really useful and neat web apps and mashups, uh, and one of which draws on our web API to provide the data. So it's a nice example of APIs enabling education as well. So I'll just take a sip. And let's go into space. So there are a lot of things that can do you harm in space, obviously. Um, one of those is the hostile radiation environment. So ionizing radiation can damage human DNA. Uh, that can lead to an increased probability of cancer, can lead to cataracts, can lead to neurological problems. Uh, and if you're in space, there are a few sources of radiation you need to watch out for. So one of those is galactic cosmic rays. Now they come from outside the solar system, from the remnants of supernovae, very high energy particles, a lot of protons, but a lot of heavier nuclei. Um, there are the other source are solar energetic particles originating from the sun. So from time to time, the sun will erupt in a solar flare. It can be highly directional, very high energy solar flares, or it can a chunk, it can have a coronal mass ejection, it's called, where it loses um, a lot of radiation. Now, if we're unlucky enough for that to be in our direction, then we need to be able to have an, a warning system and we need to be able to plan for that. Um, and another source which originates from products of the first two uh, is trapped radiation. So some of the radiation can become confined by the magnetic field of the Earth. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, so this trapped radiation is otherwise known as the Van Allen belts. Um, there is an inner belt thousands of kilometres from the surface of the planet, a little bit of a donut there of radiation, a lot of high energy protons that actually comes from the interaction of the galactic cosmic rays with the atmosphere. But there's a band there of radiation. And then tens of thousands of kilometers away from the surface of the Earth, you have the outer belt, which is mostly electrons uh, originating from the sun, solar wind from the sun. Um, and between the two, there is the slop region. If you need to loiter in space, that's the place to be. Um, but it's really important, again, that we understand how this radiation environment changes with position and with time, because again, it's dynamic. And the US Air Force Research Laboratory developed a model for that, or a number of models. Uh, and so as a, an organization planning satellite operations, planning space exploration missions, you can use that model along with your mission profile. So that, that could be an orbit, it could be a trajectory to understand what you're in for, what the weather's going to be like, and that can be used to guide decisions. So that could be used to design shielding of the craft. You don't want to have too much shielding because weight is a premium. You don't want to have too little because that can lead to problems with your craft. Oh, by the way, I mentioned the human effects of the space radiation, but it also has an effect on electronics. So it can deposit energy into semiconductor materials. It can turn a zero into a one and suddenly your logic is out and that can lead to mission failure if you don't mitigate um, through redundancy or and so forth. Um, so, yes, it can be used to guide decisions and now is it's more easily available with a web API. And so we'll connect back up to Momentum 1 and overlay the distribution of the uh, protons in the inner belt. So this is at the same altitude of the International Space Station. And you'll notice a very interesting feature, uh, which is a hotspot over the South Atlantic. Um, and what we'll do is compare that to the distribution of the magnetic field we saw before, which is this anomalous weak spot. So that demonstrates uh, one thing. It demonstrates that the magnetic field is actually protecting us. It's a protective envelope 
from the radiation of space. It deflects the galactic cosmic rays and it repels uh, some of that trapped radiation. So the weaker it is, the closer in the belt can go. Um, and so radiation levels can rise. So the International Space Station passes through that spot, uh, satellites pass through that, and again, it's dynamic, so it's changing with time, and it's very important that you understand how it changes, where it is, and take measures accordingly. For example, if you have sensitive sensors aboard your satellite, you might want to shut those down as you pass through that spot. Now, there's a lot of interest in heading to the moon and to Mars. Ask Elon Musk. He wants us to, um, what do you call it, colonize the place and set up shop there. Uh, if you're going to do that, you need to have a plan to mitigate the risks uh, of cos galactic cosmic ray exposure. Because outside the magnetic protection of the Earth, which goes out uh, 30,000, 40,000 kilometers, um, you're going to be getting a higher um, exposure to galactic cosmic rays. And so there are a number of things you need to think about, shielding spacecraft, also shielding space suits. And what we have here, oops, beg your pardon, is an, a 3D rendering of the Z2 spacesuit in the middle there. Now, the unique feature of that spacesuit is that it is actually called a suit port. So majority of the suit is outside the craft and the interface is actually at that backpack level. So the astronauts can climb directly into it. Uh, they seal it off, obviously, and then they can go out, do their business. When they want to come back, uh, they back it up uh, and then climb back out. Um, so that saves uh, the airlock. And so it's important to choose the right materials, choose the right suit structure uh, to provide appropriate shielding. And there's actually pieces of that suit on their way out to Mars aboard the Perseverance rover, where they're going to be looking at the efficacy of the um, um, shielding from radiation. And so that's it in the experiment. In the real world, we can also help out in the modeling world. So looking, exploring new materials um, in simulation. And so what, where we're helping is we're implementing an accurate model of those galactic cosmic rays and collaborating with a research group at the Center for Medical Radiation Physics at the University of Wollongong. And so we provide the source term through the API and the geometry for the suit, and then they can perform some radiation modeling, all of the fancy physics that goes on modeling the interaction of the, the former with the latter, and then perhaps feed that information back to NASA so they can um, factor that into future decisions about shielding. So this one's a nice example of web APIs enabling science. And the name of the conference is Building Business Ecosystems. So geeking out is great, but we also would love to create a sustainable business that we can grow in this area. Um, so far, APIs have been essential for us as a business. We're using them as a business development tool. Often they'll be the starting point for a conversation that leads to other projects. And we've, it's been helping us to bootstrap. And so we're monetizing them ourselves and through marketplaces and then uh, continue to serve our clients. And then growing. So one of the things I love about this business is that all these applications pop up, you'll discover some new area of science you didn't really appreciate or had no idea existed, and then you can dive in there and learn about all this amazing science. So we're exploring um, other areas and then growing the team, the A team. So on that, I'll just point out this fun little tradition we have uh, creating mission patches for the projects. Um, so we'll keep that up. And then on the right-hand side here, some corporate gold kicking, uh, including membership in the SmartSat CRC now and this NAND in deep tech incubator at ANSO. So that's me. My name's Iwan Cornelius. The company's Amentum Aerospace. Please reach out if you have any questions. I'd like to have a chat there. Uh, and thank you again for tuning in and for the opportunity to be here. So I will. Thank you so much, Ivan. And I was just mentioning on the state chat channel and also together with our team, we were admiring your presentation all together. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Essentially, I think uh, uh, all these slides topic were also catchy, but also very scientific. And Eric, the next speaker, and we were talking about, and he was mentioning now his session will be uh, looking so much unscientific now <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, no. it's all it's all hand wavy science it's 
Yeah, sorry, I hope I didn't geek out too much. I get a bit carried away. <laughs> no, I think that was amazing. And I also gives a well-rounded um, uh, overview and context around APIs, not just from the banking or not just from the technology perspective, but how it's moving uh, was space exploration. So really admire uh, the insights over there. And as part of the question, so one of the things I think in the, for the uh, audience and also for as part of the open sports, uh, there are various hubs which is available, the open portals, like from NASA, from SpaceX, or from the Hubble, you already mentioned about the uh, International Space Station. So do you have any kind of guidance or any of the recommendation for let's say the top uh, astronomy APIs? Because uh, typically if I talk about a couple of them, uh, there is like unofficial SpaceX API, uh, again used by I I SpaceX a lot. Do you have any kind of recommendation from uh, around those kind of APIs? Yes, uh, there are a lot. The ones you mentioned are the ones that I know of, really. There are, there's another Australian company, Sabre Astronautics. They provide access to some space data. Um, there's the SpaceX one. Yeah. And ESA, ESA, the European Space Agency, also has some APIs. Right. Yeah, there's a lot out there. Right, absolutely. But we, there's a lot of opportunity for us as well to help out um, on the modelling side. And I think it's going to be incredible increasingly important as well for people to access this data, um, particularly with a lot of commercial electronics going to space that's not necessarily designed for that. Yeah. Right, absolutely. And I think with the uh, more closer uh, alignment with respect to the uh, banking, insurance uh, or retail, uh, where APIs has been really flourishing and respect to uh, more evolving domains like space exploration, mineral exploration, like you mentioned. Uh, what do you think with respect to your own perspective and experience will be the next frontier, which will be bringing more alignment with respect to different domains and also bringing some of the standardization, which I think is really required when we talk about open APIs? Yeah, right. So, I mean, one thing that just comes to mind now is this the async API side of things and the event-driven architecture. I mentioned earlier on in the presentation that there are certain types of calculations that are very computationally intensive. It's not necessarily feasible to have them in a REST uh, API given the time delay in the calculation. So I think in that regard, uh, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for us to start using that and get involved, yeah. Absolutely. And I think the next thing which I think about is the, uh, the security aspect. Because still, I think uh, security is a bit of lagging while the innovation is coming really strongly within the APIs. So from your perspective, what do you think should be the key focus when we talk about embedding security as part of the APIs lifecycle? Right. So it's not necessarily user data, I think, that's the crucial part in the scientific API because we're not collecting much user data at all. It's very important, obviously. Um, but it's important to guarantee the integrity of the scientific information as well. If people are using this information to make critical mission critical uh, decisions, then it's very important to um, make sure that information's um, well, maintain the integrity of the information. Yes. So I think that's uh, where a lot of uh, contribution could happen. Right. Yeah. yeah, completely agree. And I also have a quick question from the audience uh, from Isha Arya. And she mentioned that, have you noticed any additional requirements when it comes to security for APIs with HPC and large data sets? H additional security requirements for HPC and large data sets. So that side of the business is not, we're not working in the API domain in that side of the business at the moment. Um, I mean, most of the security of the high performance computing facilities managed by the facility. So, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, as yeah, I mentioned that we'll start getting into that and um, maybe in the next API days, uh, there'll be a better answer. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I think we still have a couple of minutes left. And I was really fascinated with some of the aspects where you're moving as part of your own company. 
So do you uh, would like to share uh, some of the additional aspects, diving a bit deeper around the vision you have for, let's say, in the next couple of years, where you see uh, what kind of additional exploration uh, and also the developments and integration with the APIs you are planning to do as part of a broader spectrum? Right. So, um, yes, there's productization of the APIs themselves, uh, but they can also drive other product development, for example, applications, mobile apps, web apps and the like. They can be based on these scientific APIs. So we'll get, we're going to be exploring that as well. Yes. And in addition to that, all of the scientific modeling tools right at the start of the presentation mentioned actually used to design hardware. So we can actually start to um, use some of these components in other projects with regards to sensor development. Yes. So that's where we see it going. I mean, it's a startup company, so things can pivot at any moment. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine. But I think uh, you have already shared a couple of platforms and the overall ecosystem you're working in. And I think API is definitely at the center of true digital transformation. And specifically with the new normal coming in, it becomes uh, more and more essential in order to do it. Uh, but essentially, because as part of some of the audiences, they are still in the early stages of their API adoption. So do you have any kind of guidance talking about different aspects of domain? let's say uh, the top five benefits uh, in deploying APIs as part of your businesses, uh, irrespective of which domain you are currently working in? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, for us, it's been, we haven't known much else. For us, it happened pretty early on. We just saw this opportunity and went, yes, let's go. So uh, for us, it's been a great benefit. Absolutely, API, not first, but Almost first, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, but like you mentioned now, and I heard in a previous talk, somebody said data is a new oil. So it really is, I think, a boom, a boom period for APIs as well. Right, yeah. And from your own experience, is, uh, uh, would you like to share the major challenges you faced while adopting and also evolving APIs as part of your wider business ecosystem? Um, not geeking out too much. I mean, and maintaining focus with scientists and software developers. So um, there's so much where we see we can help out and we love science. So I'd say focus, maintaining focus, knowing where to focus efforts. That's a challenge. Right, absolutely. Great, Ivan. So once again, fabulous presentation and Thank you. insights which you shared with the audience. And I, I think you can also see some of the feedback coming in uh, at the state channel from the audience. And really looking forward to the next API days to know more about your journey. And I think uh, these kind of sessions also make it much inclusive, uh, irrespective of various domains and leaders like you coming together to share the broader spectrum of API's evolution, uh, both at the regional as well as the global level. So thank right. you so much for joining in again and hoping to see you again uh, next time. Fantastic. Thanks. Me too. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having us. All right. Bye, dear. Bye, everyone. Bye.